Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jörg Schatzimakake, Secretary General of Hydrogen Europe, and uh, I'm pleased to address this conference on uh, the Energy Summit of DII. We, as the hydrogen guys, have seen some remarkable months uh, and weeks in the last year. The 8th of July was a game changer because that was the day when the EU hydrogen strategy was adopted, including a quite significant scale up of uh, 40 gigawatt uh, electrolyzer capacity in Europe and additionally 40 gigawatt outside Europe, mainly Northern Africa, mainly Morocco. Uh, and so this goes back to an old DII position and you are aware of this paper because you are one of the co-authors. So this was very, very uh, impactful. At the same time, the energy system integration uh, initiative was taken by the EU Commission, which wants to combine different parts of the energy system, like the renewable power production, but also the use of uh, pipelines for um, the transport, the cheap and affordable transport of this renewable energy via molecules. So this goes hand in hand. And the third very important element was the launch of the European Clean Hydrogen Alliance. In the meanwhile, it has much more than 1,000 members, uh, an alliance that wants to cope with this strategy. Hydrogen has now reached the top of uh, the EU. Uh, we have seen that uh, the executive vice president, Timmermans, has been a clear fan of hydrogen as a technology for his European Green Deal that he is responsible for. He always says hydrogen rocks and he is committed to make it a success. But also Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, has in the meanwhile addressed at several meetings and events this important element. Also at member states level, hydrogen has taken clearly momentum. So um, we can see that uh, many member states have dedicated hydrogen uh, strategies. So you have uh, strategies in these countries here and they all, they started in late uh, 2018. Um, and uh, um, in 2019, we saw some strategies already in Asian countries, but in the years, uh, in the last year, many, many countries joined the hydrogen strategies. And if you go down and look a little bit more granular in what happens there, you can see that the member states also earmark money for the different hydrogen strategies. Uh, Germany, in the meanwhile, 9 billion. And by the way, it's important to understand that 2 billion of it will be deployed, will be um, invested uh, into um, importing countries. So countries uh, where hydrogen should be produced to import it then to Germany. Uh, that's a clear part of the strategy. Spain, some 9 billion. France, uh, more than 7 billion. Portugal, remarkably 7 to 9 billion. Uh, Port Portugal, uh, possibly and will be one of the giants of hydrogen production in the future. So the chase of the future will be Portuguese, uh, to put it like that. Austria, 2 billion, and Italy, some 10 billion. So all together, uh, the member states of the European Union have already earmarked 46 billion for hydrogen strategies in the next 10 years. That's remarkable. Now, the question is, can we do it on our own, we Europeans? Can we produce that much hydrogen uh, as we need? Um, what you see here is the different forms of hydrogen. Gray hydrogen at the moment being the dominant form of hydrogen being produced mainly for industrial uses, but with a very bad um, uh, greenhouse gas footprint, uh, as gray hydrogen is one kilo uh, producing 10 kilos of CO2, no good. So it needs to be replaced immediately. And you can see here that with regards to our hydrogen strategy, uh, especially uh, with the targets that uh, have been formulated in the hydrogen strategy of the European Commission, um, the year 24 is the target year to have already a starting point for massive production. Uh, so in 24, we want 
to have an installation of six gigawatt electrolyzer capacity already and one million ton of renewably produced hydrogen. And you can see here the prediction, so to say, of the renewable produced hydrogen, the green hydrogen, but also including low carbon hydrogen. And you can see that gray hydrogen will, will really fade out uh, considerably over the years. Um, there's also hydrogen as a byproduct. Um, so this strategy uh, covers the years until 2030 um, that we have uh, announced. So 40 gigawatt in 2030 in Europe and outside Europe. Um, from 24 to 2030, that's a tenfold uh, increase. But all in all, we will need much more. Uh, we will need 700 plus gigawatt uh, until 2050 if we really want uh, these targets that we have as Europeans in the European Green Deal to be adopted. To, en to enable clean hydrogen to replace all unabated fossil hydrogen con consumption and to replace fossil fuels and feedstocks in other sectors where hydrogen can play a role, this is the number, 700 gigawatt, um, and uh, it's fully clear that we cannot do this uh, on our own. As Europeans, we need to import it. Uh, and uh, the last G20 summit hosted by Saudi Arabia was very clear. Uh, so the host country, Saudi Arabia said, they are moving out of fossil energy, out of oil, Saudi Arabia, out of oil and into uh, the renewable production of hydrogen and blending it then with CO2 to produce synthetic fuels. Um, the next slide shows that um, there are some regions, of course, uh, all over uh, the Euro European Union that need more uh, hydrogen than uh, some others. Um, so basically it's Germany and the Netherlands that are by far the biggest hydrogen consumers already uh, at the moment, of course, gray hydrogen uh, with large demand centers in the Ruhr Valley, in Leuna, in, in the industrial area but also in the North Sea and in the maritime ports. Um, I would say especially uh, Rotterdam uh, is one of the very developed hydrogen areas. And uh, these are the first customers, uh, the industrial clusters over there, and we need to understand how to bring hydrogen there. Um, and there are, of course, now already different predictions or different conditions for the renewable hydrogen production when it comes to costs. Here you see a an interesting map that shows that the cheapest renewable hydrogen production costs today uh, are in um, solar uh, and uh, combined with electrolysis. And uh, this cheap production uh, can be done in the sun-rich Mediterranean belt. Yet neither Germany nor the Netherlands have great PV solar resources. Um, and until offshore wind becomes more cost competitive uh, in the short to medium term, renewable hydrogen production costs in the north uh, will be um, two to three <coughs> euro per kilogram uh, lower due to solar. Um, and that's, so to say, the, um, our big um, uh, issue that we need to tackle. If you look at the world map, this is a map that has been created by the IEA. Um, you see that um, there are some hot spots like Chile, uh, also like parts of, uh, of Asia, South Africa, um, where hydrogen production will be very, very cheap. And here you see the MENA region. The MENA region, including also uh, Morocco, belongs to the cheapest places for the production of renewable hydrogen. Um, and this is something uh, we, of course, take into account when we fulfill and implement the European hydrogen strategy the clean hydrogen strategy. Um, for the first mm, time of the implementation, uh, renewable hydrogen imports via ships will play a considerable role. And of course, uh, also other geographies like the US, uh, like Asian countries are developing their hydrogen strategies, are uh, starting to have a higher demand on renewably produced hydrogen and uh, Chile most probably will deliver to the US. Um, Australia and some Asian uh, countries will mainly deliver uh, to uh, Japan, Korea. Uh, and uh, yeah, what you can see here is already uh, Europe as one of the main destinations uh, for this. You can see here that um, there are also 
costs, of course, to it um, that are at the moment clearly to see the cost of shipping um, uh, of uh, liquid uh, hydrogen in liquid form is estimated at 1.5 to 2 US dollar per kilogram. Um, the import cost estimated uh, to be even lower for ammonia as hydrogen carrier. Uh, and there we have an infrastructure that is partly in place. I know that there are projects in Morocco um, that go already in the ammonia direction where nitrogen is um, used to produce ammonia from renewable sources, so green ammonia, and that is cheaper as some installations, some facilities exist already and are in place. Um, the next step for us will now be to combine all these efforts uh, that we have in implementing the hydrogen strategies by ramping up big projects uh, demonstrators. Uh, this will be in the years 22 to 25. We showed that already. That's so to say the project implementation phase. But then as of 25, we will have massive production of hydrogen starting and we will need um, some regulatory elements. And that is why we are preparing at the moment a Clean Hydrogen Act encompassing uh, regulation for uh, hydrogen infrastructure um, and of course some market incentivization tools. Uh, when it comes to infrastructure, the ideal world is next to shipping and using harbors or ports as a hub um, to use pipelines, existing pipelines uh, already. These regulatory and legal aspects uh, need uh, to be tackled. Um, the Europe, European Union is working um, towards a net zero carbon economy by 2050. Europe imports most fossil fuels it consumes, hence the switch to clean hydrogen is a, is a strategic step uh, and the main thrust um, behind this hydrogen strategy. The European hydrogen strategy is rich in ambition, <laughs> um, but uh, poor in policy detail. Uh, and that is what we need to fix. Um, the current policy and regulatory elements of hydrogen are distributed over different legislations that exist already, like gas, electricity, fuels, emissions, and industrial frameworks. And that is a big risk to have a patchwork and to have a fragmentation. And that's why we are preparing this Clean Hydrogen Act um, to have a dedicated legal regime for this. Um, we need a clear and good um, system of um, um, guarantees of origin for that, because uh, without guarantees of origin, it will be uh, very different. This system of guarantees of origin should also be distinct from, from gas and from electricity uh, because uh, we are the gas, but uh, there are 50 different uh, guarantees of origin schemes and even more for gas. We need one clear for hydrogen, um, uh, also distinct from electricity because hydrogen needs a grid, but also can be a commodity traded um, without a grid. Uh, then we also need the adoption of a methodology for the calculation of the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions from renewable and low carbon hydrogen. Um, otherwise, it will be very difficult to uh, have clear uh, plans, if you wish, for the highway uh, to a hydrogen market. Um, and we need this methodology, which, by the way, uh, creates also fairness uh, to all the other um, carriers of energy. Then we need to establish a robust system of carbon reduction uh, where CO2 content of energy carriers and vectors will become the new currency of the energy system. That is what is important. Uh, it's the CO2 content that in the end will um, decide about the price of the energy carrier. Uh, also, there needs to be a transparent mechanism for tracing and tracking of the carbon content. Um, this is a prerequisite. And this was, would enable a clear taxonomy and prioritization. Um, you, you see that all over our plans, uh, including uh, the DII vision of uh, yeah, Desert Tech some years ago, and um, I, I don't want to hide that that was one of the reasons why I became active also uh, in, in a political sense, <clears throat> this Desert Tech idea uh, made me a hydrogen guy in, uh, many years ago. 
um, because uh, it, it was the right spark, uh, but we tried to build it on electricity first. And now the combination of electricity and hydrogen, that seems to be the magic, the magic solution. I have to say thank you for your cooperation. Thanks for uh, all the very good proposals that uh, come from your side. Uh, and uh, we want to stay and we hope to stay and we will stay a very, very good partner of DII. Uh, and we are also proud to do this cooperation. Thanks very much indeed. Bye-bye.